Welcome to District 32 Radio. I'm Jackie Campbell, and I have met the most incredible person. So we've decided to haul her in, kicking and screaming for an interview. I always thought, when I engaged tutors for my children, that they taught them what the problem was. For example, if I engaged a maths tutor, they taught me, or taught my, my, my kids, about maths. But... Apparently, there's a completely different way of doing it, and it's much more successful. So we're joined today by Dr. Penny McLinn. She is a bit of an expert in this area. Penny, welcome. Thank you very much, Jackie. Um, yeah, my business is very different from other tutoring businesses. Uh, it's called Brave Heart Tutoring, and I operate from South Fremantle from home. Sure, right. So a home-based business, obviously, which is brilliant because it gives you a chance to really immerse in, obviously, what's what's going yeah. on. Well, students yeah. aren't coming and sitting in a formal formal space. No, I guess it makes and I have my beautiful dog, Oscar, who sits in the classroom, and the kids get a two-minute brain break, and they invariably go and play with Oscar. <laughs> which is actually very helpful because it calms them down and gets them very receptive to what I have to say. Okay. So it's, it's interesting. So what makes Braveheart tutoring different than perhaps what I've experienced with my children in the past? Yeah, Braveheart um, basically teaches three different things. The first one is kids at school have a lot of information just thrown at them and they have no idea what to do with it. And this first occurred to me when I was at home with young kids and I went to a, I was doing tutoring and I went to tutor a biology student and I said to him, where are your biology notes? And he had a whole wall full of pigeonholes and he just got his hand and he waved it across the wall and he said, they're all up there. And to me, that was like a light bulb moment because it was a picture of his brain. He had no idea what to do with these things. Right. So I developed a lot of activities that would help children learn how to learn and turned that into a program which was used. I was working at MLC across all year eight students in science and was amazing success and kids got improved results. So that was done at school and uh, I used that study as part of my PhD in learning strategies. Um, the other students I teach are kids with diagnosed learning difficulties, so dysgraphia, dyslexia, ADHD, all those sort of things. Dysgraphia, what's that? Dysgraphia is where a child can't actually write properly. And I had a student come in recently and uh, with dysgraphia and um, I use a tracing app and then they write in the air and then they write on paper. And after two sessions, the mum came in and she said, I've been paying therapists years to get this result and you've done it in two weeks. Fantastic, and was that's because you, because you do things differently? Yes, do things very differently. Uh, for instance, the posture, you get with dysgraphia, you get the grip right on the pen and you get them sitting up straight so that they can do an arm swing calmly and their writing just goes ballistic. It's amazing. Wow, okay. Um, sorry. Because, because, no, I was just saying, because these days we just have a tendency to elbows on the corners of the chairs and tippity-tap away. But yeah. You do need writing at some point. Absolutely. Somebody yeah. to tell my husband that. Yeah. <laughs> my daughter describes his writing as the accidental scratchings of an epileptic chicken. <laughs> And to be honest, she's not too far from the truth. Oh, but it does, he writes in capitals because he can't actually physically write. So yes. that, that... Well, send him along. He's left-handed, what can you do? <laughs> <laughs> and the third one, which is very different from any other tutoring business, is I work with kids who have anxiety and low self-esteem issues. Okay. And I have a number of activities that I do. So all in all, I've got like a menu of 60 different activities. And for each child, I just pick out the appropriate activities to do with that student. So each kid gets an individualised learning plan. Right. Um, well, it doesn't sound like you're teaching kids to read or you're teaching them how to tackle their maths problems or what to do in science. Surely, isn't that what a tutor is supposed to do? Yes, I do do all of that. I'm a secondary science teacher. Right. Um, so I can, I can teach from year one to year 12 
and I have the capacity to teach maths and English and um, also science, of course, being my content area. Um, I'm able to help up to year 12 in science, um, perhaps with um, English probably to year 8 level, um, but m most parents want the learning to learn. Right. That's it's the it, biggest it, thing. It would seem to be an, an assumed skill. I mm. mean, as no. you said, you said, but you just throw information. To, I mean, I've met, had some fantastic teachers in my time, but we and they sort of throw information yeah. out and they say catch. Yes, and then exactly. the kids are supposed to work out what to do with it next. Exactly. And if if your child doesn't know how to play catch, well, mm. that mm. sounds like fundamentally the problem to be tackled first. Yes, and it it is bizarre that they don't teach it at school. Uh, they don't teach how to learn at school, and I in my research. I surveyed 280 science teachers and 90% of them said that they really would like to do it, it needs to be done, but we don't have time. The curriculum is too, too full. Too full. Mm. Um, so I assume that applies across most subjects. Right. Um, so is that where, if someone's got a, a challenge, a, ch a child who obviously has a learning challenge, it can be really dramatic. On, I remember my, my son was struggling at school. He's mm. he was a big kid. Now mm. I'm not talking huge fat. I'm talking mm. tall. I'm talking strong. six foot two, <laughs> broad you know, shoulders. Broad shoulders. He looks like he he looked like he was you know, three years older than he should be. Yeah, he was yeah. just a big kid, and he did a lot of sports and a lot yeah. of water sports. And he used to get teased, mm. mercilessly teased, oh which is bizarre for being so big. because he's such such a big kid. But not only that, he was a, he wasn't such a quiet kid, but he was mm. definitely a child who would prefer to say, just take it on the chin. And mm. he, he was really aware of his size mm. and the ability that he could have, mm. should he cho have chosen to, mm. to have a really dramatic yeah. physical impact on yes. the people around him. Yes. And he chose not to. Good for him. Well, yeah. it was... <laughs> It was a it, it was a huge thing for him, to, but sometimes yeah. hanging on to that yes. just became very difficult. And he got yeah. called a wuss and a sissy and yeah. a, all sorts of names. That yes. bullying we noticed yeah, really I, impacted yeah. his yeah. the way he represented himself in class yes. and how he engaged. Yes, yes. The the criticism from other kids, um, I deal with that, and I help a lot with bullied kids. Um, basically, by looking at several things. Um, one is the difference between self-esteem and what's called self-compassion. So self-esteem, we all think our oh, kids should have a high self-esteem. But really, high self-esteem comes from judging yourself against everybody else. Right. And some people judge themselves to be much worse than everybody else. Whereas self-compassion takes the approach that you know, you are actually a, a, an okay person and you've got to look after yourself. So that negative critical voice, you have to stop it. And I do this with diagrams. The kids draw their representation of a negative critical voice. And sometimes it'll be a monster, sometimes it'll be a, a campfire. And then we have the response and they might draw a bucket with water and they'll write in their responses to the bullies and then they'll, in their imagination, tip the bucket on the fire. Right. And it works just like a charm. And they develop, you know, a number of responses to a critical voice, which can be a real voice or inside their heads. And it's more often inside their heads with okay. bullying. So that sounds like Braveheart has a completely almost, what well, I've never heard of it, a unique approach to solving these fundamental issues yeah. way before they, well, which I guess in turn solves the mm. ability to the fact that you can't add up and you can't mm. take notes mm. or you can't process information which yeah. is thrown at you. Yeah, so I do all the, the maths and I've got a lot of um, websites that I use, apps that I use. Um, I keep the kids really engaged. Um, every half an hour, as I said before, they get a brain break, which the research shows is really important. Um, but the reason I got into tutoring was I was teaching at MLC. Um, I've taught at a lot of private girls schools and I would introduce a concept and then I would do this thing where everybody had to put their head on their desk and 
after I taught a concept and they had thumbs up if they fully understood it, sideways if they partially understood it, and downwards if they didn't understand it. So the first run through I'd get two thirds understand it, um, two or three kids not understanding it and the rest partially understanding it. Then I would get a student who understood it to go up to the board and reteach the concept. And the research is that students learn better from each other than from teachers. So the student would redo the concept and heads down again, thumbs up, and you'd get 95% of them with their thumbs up. Interesting. And of course, the child that's been taught the concept has overlearned that she's, exactly. or he, or she in this case, has got an additional confidence. Yeah. You didn't find that that impacted the students with going, they were, they, were, they didn't want to put their other their thumbs up because no. someone was going to, you're going to make them teach it, or that the students were afraid to put their thumbs down because they didn't want to? No, because they knew that if they put their thumbs down, I would get the rest of the group to be working on an activity related to the concept just introduced and I would take those two or three students and invite them to the side. I'd go and stand at one of the side benches with a big sheet of butcher's paper and say would anybody like to come over uh, and join me to run through this I- these ideas and they would come over and it's amazing one on one it makes such a difference but there was always the odd ones I couldn't reach. Mm. The ones with the learning difficulties, um, you know, the ones who were really struggling, and that's why I decided to finish teaching and go into tutoring so I could get to that 1% that I couldn't reach in the classroom. And hence Braveheart. And hence Braveheart, because they need to be brave. They need to realise that they're not, um, you know, up to speed on certain things and they have to be open to change and development. So and being up to speed on, not, not up to speed on things is actually okay. Yeah, and I'll have little kids come in that have got three or four diagnosed learning difficulties mm. and I develop really nice relationships with the kids. We are really good at putting labels on people, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So if someone is obviously struggling with their their children, they would like to look at perhaps helping in a different way. What is the best way that they can get hold of you, Penny? Um, You can go to my website, which is www.bravehearttutoring.com.au. Facebook is, uh, sorry, email is braveheart.tutoring at gmail.com. Or by phone zero four two zero five seven three four five four. Okay. Well, I would highly encourage anybody who's listening to this who got even a concern to drop a drop your line or give you a call because having a conversation with you for me has been really clarifying. And mm. I think sometimes you just need to know that these things can be sorted. Mm. And from our conversation, that sound, you sound like completely the best person to start with. The other thing I'm doing is looking at Skype classes for kids out of the area because there's a particular girl in Helena Valley whose mother is desperate. She can't find any help. Um, So she's going to ring me and we're going to try and organise a Skype session. Fantastic. We'd love to hear how that goes. Maybe we can catch up again. Yes. That'd be great. Cool. Thanks, Penny. Okay, great.